Hello and welcome to Obscure History. In part 7 of this series, we left the Seleucid Empire, juggernaut of the Hellenistic world, in a state of unease to say the least. The mostly unremarkable reign of the rightful and undisputed King Seleucus IV came to an abrupt end under suspicious circumstances in 175 BC. At this point in the narrative, his youngest son, the five-year-old Antiochus, was proclaimed the new Vasileus. But the real power was held by the old monarch's chief minister and probable murderer, Heliodorus. Being too young to have any say in the actual governing of the realm, this arrangement would have benefited the aristocrats as they could accumulate a greater degree of autonomy whilst the surrounding external powers preferred an empire without its strong figurehead, most notably amongst them was Rome, who still held the eldest of Seleucus's sons, the young prince Demetrius, as a hostage. As we will now see, this volatile situation allowed our new main protagonist to take centre stage and seize the day. So join me as we discuss the life and times of Antiochus IV. Born in the year 215 BC, the future Antiochus IV started life off named Mithridates, making a clear connection to the rulers of Pontus through his mother Laodice III. As the youngest of the three sons of Antiochus III Megas, young Mithridates must have viewed his future prospects of rulership as highly unlikely. His odds at rule did increase slightly after his older brother's death in 194 BC. Sometime between this and his departure to Rome in 188 BC, Mithridates had his name changed to Antiochus, probably to honour his fallen brother and to keep one of the two traditional family names going. We won't go into the details of said treaty again, but for our current purposes, Antiochus was selected as one of the 20 hostages that were to be sent to Rome to ensure Antiochus III's continued good behaviour. Every three years, the hostages would be swapped out for new ones, with the only exception to this being the young prince. So it was that at the age of 27, Antiochus found himself shipped off to Rome, where he would spend the next 10 years of his life in comfortable captivity. He was able to cultivate many friendships in high places, including scholars and even many senators of the day, particularly with the young members of the elite in Rome. If there is any particular truth to the stories regarding Antiochus's character, which we will go into more detail later, then his outward going personality would have easily charmed and endured him in the eyes of the Romans. The young prince would have learned a lot about the inner workings of the Republic during his stay. Rome's idea of a political hostage was to give them a proper Roman education and to treat them as befitting their station. The ultimate goal of this, from their perspective, was to turn a potential enemy into an ally who would be more amenable to the Republic's interests or at the very least to instill friendly relations should they be released. Quintus Asconius Pedanus, a Roman historian who was active during the 1st century AD, compiled many commentaries and histories from around the time of Marcus Tullius Cicero. In a correspondence between Cicero and a childhood friend of his, Titus Pomponius Atticus, there is mention that a house in Rome had originally been built for Antiochus IV at public expense, which would have been no small expenditure given his royal station. By the way, this is one of the ways we know that Antiochus had indeed changed his name from Mithridates by this time. By 178 BC, his time as a political hostage finally came to an end when the Senate had decided that the then reigning Vasileus 
Sir Lucas IV Philopator was to send his eldest son, the Prince Demetrius, to Rome to take his uncle's place. It is probable the two met for a brief moment during the exchange, but no record of this has survived. Departing by ship, Antiochus began his meander back to his homeland, but decided that he was in no hurry to return. He arrived in Athens, where he was to spend the next three years as an honoured guest. A surviving decree by the Athenians honours the prince during his stay, dated between 178 to 177 BC. A curious side note is the production of a new style Athenian tetradrachm coin, with the name Antiochus accompanied by subtle iconography of Seleucid power in the shape of an elephant. The name Antiochus was not limited to the Seleucid royal family, but the appearance of the elephant does create a strong link to our protagonist. If correct, then the honours heaped upon the prince were indeed great, as the names on these coins were usually reserved only for the year's chief magistrates. This in turn strongly suggests that the Athenians not only granted citizenship to Antiochus, an act which in itself was one of the highest honours a Greek community could bestow on anyone, but they also allowed him to take an active part in the governing of their affairs. He most definitely used many of these coins to help finance a renovation of the Theatre of Dionysus and the construction of a temple to Zeus, a god who we will see over time will be his top deity of choice. By 175 BC, news would have reached the ears of Antiochus of the sudden end of his brother's reign in Syria, and that his nephew was now prompted up onto the Seleucid throne with the backing of Heliodorus. He bid the people of Athens farewell to travel further east, but our source on what happens next actually comes from another Athenian decree. This time the honours go to King Eumenes II of Pergamon and his brothers for their backing of Antiochus to the Seleucid diadem. Whilst tradition dictated that the rulers of Pergamon and the empire were not on good relations at the best of times, Eumenes saw an opportunity to back his own chariot in the form of Antiochus, who could offer greater guarantees of a stable relationship between the two states over a boy and his regent who were seen as too destabilizing. In return for his future goodwill, the prince received the full backing of the Pergamene monarch's much needed resources. The Athenian decree has this to say on the matter. Quote, when Seleucos had passed away and circumstances invited it, observing that they provided an opportunity for laying a store of gratitude and benefaction, and having arranged all the other incidentals and deploying themselves, accompanying him up to the borders of his own kingdom, and having supported him with money, and having supplied forces, and having adorned him with the diadem, along with other accoutrements, as was appropriate, and having offered sacrifice, and having made assurances of good faith towards each other with every good will and affection, in a remarkable way they joined in restoring King Antiochus to his ancestral rule. With Eumenes as his patron, and having received the garments and symbols of a true Vasileus before crossing into Calicia, the ancient sources give no detail on how he assumed power. It seems reasonable to assume that the Pergamene force continued to accompany the now crowned Antiochus IV all the way to Antioch in Syria. There is no mention of any kind of resistance against the newcomers, allowing for a smooth journey to the capital. Here we can imagine the crowds of Antiochians rejoicing for the return of the prince who was the last remaining son of one of their greatest rulers. It is highly likely that the Seleucid army also supported the older Antiochus 
in his quest to power, which would help to explain the seeming lack of any coherent resistance. It is not difficult to imagine that the puppeteer Heliodorus was never too popular with the people and army to begin with. Speaking of the minister, we never hear any further mention of him again once Antiochus arrives at the western capital, which is a good way of saying he was either exiled or executed. Luckily for the younger Antiochus, his life would be spared if only for the moment. Unluckily for the boy's mother, Laodice IV, she now had the unfortunate distinction of having married all three of her brothers at some point in time and having had children with all of them. This was all done in the name of lending legitimacy to the usurper, for he needed every advantage he could obtain, whilst the real heir to the throne, the Prince Demetrius, was still being kept as a hostage in Rome. So it was that in this manner, Antiochus IV's illegal seizure of power was a complete success by the end of 175 BC. To top this, he assumed the all-encompassing title of Epiphanes, meaning God Manifested, linking himself closely to Zeus, the greatest and best of all the Greek Hellenic pantheon. I want to discuss Antiochus' seizure of power in more detail and what this meant for the empire going forwards, as it would have profound impacts, but this will be saved for much later. Soon after his accession to the diadem, the Vassileus knew that his sudden power grab would cause a stir with the neighbouring states. And he was right, for Rome, after soon receiving news of the boy king's dethronement, had sent officials to find out the new king's intentions and to report these findings back to the Senate. Once they returned, the Roman envoy gave a very favourable assessment for Antiochus had received them warmly and made assurances to treat them with all due respect and reverence. Not long after this, the Vassileus sent his own mission to the Eternal City. Upon their arrival, the Seleucid delegates were brought before the Senate. Livy has this to say on their visit. Quote, their leader, Apollonius, when introduced to the Senate, alleged many valid reasons why the king was paying his tribute after the appointed day. He had, however, brought the whole amount so that no favour need be shown to the king beyond excusing the delay. He had, in addition, brought a present of golden vases weighing 500 pounds. The king asked that the friendship and alliance which had been formed with his father might be renewed with him, and that the people of Rome would look to him for all that a friendly monarch could supply. He would never be lacking in any service he could render them. During his stay in Rome, he reminded the house it was due to the kindness of the Senate and the friendliness of the younger men that he was treated as a prince more than a hostage. The deputation received a gracious reply, and the city praetor, Atelius, was ordered to renew the alliance with Antiochus, which had existed with his father. The tribute was given into the charge of the city quaestors, and the golden vases were handed to the censors with instructions to deposit them in whatever temples they saw fit. The leader of the deputation received a present of a hundred thousand asses, and free quarters and hospitality were decreed to him as long as he remained in Italy. The commissioners who had been in Syria had reported that he held the highest place of honour with the king and was a devoted friend to Rome. There were many factors that were in Antiochus's favour during his dealings with Rome thus far. His time there, of course, played a significant hand in this, for many prominent senators knew the man on a personal level. It's safe to say that those senators chosen to scope out the situation in Syria would have already been friends with the new ruler. These same senators were further assured of his good intentions 
with the handover of the remaining war indemnity of the Treaty of Apamea, along with those gifts as already mentioned. Even before the Seleucids arrived, the Romans had been in contact with Eumenes II, who essentially gave them a glowing report on Antiochus's conduct thus far. As Pergamon was Rome's leading ally in the eastern Mediterranean, who had done much to place the new monarch on the Seleucid throne, Rome could be assured that Antiochus was going to be a cooperative king and ally. With his standing with the Republic now sky high, he turned inward to better secure the rest of his realm. To achieve this, he first dispatched the nobleman Timarchus to replace the current satrap of Media, which had become a critical post in recent years. The rich satrapy required a substantial military presence for checking the rising ambitions of the Parthians and Greco-Bactrians further east, and so the king needed someone he could fully trust to fill the post. Timarchus had also accompanied Apollonius on the trip to Rome to further ensure that that mission was a success. He had been one of the other nobles who had accompanied Antiochus as a hostage, and so he would have known the best senators to target in order to win further support for his master's cause. Whilst Timarchus travelled east, his brother Heraclides was to stay in Antioch after being appointed Minister of the Royal Finances. We know that both brothers hailed from the city of Miletus, as a surviving inscription on the side of the city's council house informs us that they helped finance its construction on behalf of their master. This is certainly not the last we will hear of Timarchus, but it will be a while before he makes another appearance. Another important individual also hailing from Miletus, is the strategoi of Phoenicia and Collier Syria, Apollonius, who we have already met within our narrative. Not to be confused with the Apollonius that had been sent as an ambassador to Rome, the governor was another high-ranking official within the Seleucid court, serving also as a chief minister of state to Seleucus IV. It was, after all, this Apollonius who had told Seleucus about the vast fortunes being housed in the temple treasury in Jerusalem, who had in turn been informed about it by Simon, who despised the high priest at the time, Annias III. For reasons that aren't explicitly stated, Apollonius resented the coming to power of Antiochus IV, and so retired to his hometown living the rest of his life in obscurity. Whilst he was a capable governor, Antiochus probably breathed a sigh of relief once he heard of his departure. As someone who had access to considerable force of arms due to the location, and had also served his brother's regime, the new king could have had a serious uprising on his hands. It would have been easy for Apollonius to declare open rebellion in the name of his former master's son, who arguably had a better claim to the diadem than the usurper uncle. But luckily for all involved, the threat never materialised. Observing the state of affairs in the lands beyond Collier Syria, Antiochus appointed a certain Jason to the high priesthood of Jerusalem by 174 BC. Jason was a scion of the Oneid family, which had held the high priesthood for much of the Second Temple period from the 4th century BC onwards. Similar to the situation the Seleucid household was now in, Jason had replaced his brother Aeneas, who was, as we already covered, had been high priest during the attempted raid of the temple by Heliodorus. Ancient sources share a number of different arguments for Jason's appointment. One such argument from the Book of Maccabees accuses Antiochus of creating a bidding war for the position, after the king suspected Aeneas of harbouring pro-Ptolemaic sympathies. The bid was to be paid annually using the very treasures housed within the Second Temple itself, an arrangement that had been in effect before Antiochus IV's seizure of power 
but one that would allow the Seleucids to siphon even more wealth from the Jews. Jason was all too happy to outbid his rivals and so pledged the highest amount of tribute from the treasury. It is worth mentioning that the Book of Maccabees as a source are abundant with details of the events we are currently discussing. That said, whilst this and many other sources do give us that detail, they clearly hold a very hostile stance towards Antiochus IV and anyone seen as being closely associated with the Seleucids. This hostility also extended to those who were seen as perverting the faith of the Jews with the practice of Hellenization, which by this time was arguably at its peak throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and beyond. Maccabees is also where we hear of the high priesthood being auctioned off, which if true, would be corruption of the highest degree for sure, but we can't be too certain of this given the established bias towards the king and his supporters, which may or may not be exaggerating the facts. The other major reason given for Jason's appointment is that both he and Antiochus wanted to increase the level of Hellenization in Judea to integrate the territory and the people with the wider world around them more. Up until this point, the level of Hellenization in Judea seems to have been fairly minimal. Both previous Seleucid and Ptolemaic rulers were acutely aware that a great deal of freedom for worship and general autonomy was necessary to keep the general populace of the area productive and happy. With Jason getting the nod from the Vasileus, Book 1 of Maccabees tells us of Jason's actions now as high priest. Quote, In those days, lawless men came forth from Israel and misled many, saying, Let us go and make a covenant with the Gentiles around about us, for since we separated from them, many evils have come upon us. This proposal pleased them, and some of them eagerly went to the king. He authorized them to observe the ordinances of the Gentiles. So they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem, according to Gentile customs, and removed the marks of circumcision and abandoned the Holy Covenant. They joined with the Gentiles and sold themselves to do evil. In addition to this, Jason was permitted to rename Jerusalem as Antiochia, and had the privilege of determining who would be permitted to live a Hellenic lifestyle as a new Greek pole. The building of the gymnasium may not seem like a big deal to us, but to the Greeks, admittance to the gymnasium was normally restricted to Greek citizens and was in itself a hallmark for citizenship. Like with most things in life, there was a financial element to it all as well. The funds Jason used to finance these Greek projects would most probably have been from the temple treasury. I imagine some people were not all too pleased knowing that their tribute to the god Yahweh was being used to finance constructions to false idols. Such settlements were of course common throughout the Hellenistic dominions, but it did not stop the growing concern among the more traditional practitioners of the Jewish faith. They saw the alarming rate at which the people of Judea were practicing these strange customs as a threat to their identity and autonomy. It was one thing to be paying an increased annual tribute, but to blatantly mislead the people away from the one true God was seen as utter blasphemy to some. Despite the rather damning passage covered, it seems that these sentiments were only shared by those few conservative circles. Jason apparently kept the basic laws and practices of the old faith enforced, such as the Sabbath, as to not completely alienate himself from his fellow countrymen. This policy of playing it safe looked to be paying off for Jason, as many of the ordinary people were content to allow the practice of the Greek ways to take place alongside them, at least for the time being. In 173 BC, Antiochus personally travelled to the Phoenician city of Tyre to spectate the Quadrennial Games, 
which was essentially an imitation of the Greek Olympian ones. Whilst there, Maccabees too describes how the vile Jason sent envoys from the newly renamed Antiochia to carry 300 silver drachma for the sacrifice to Heracles, which the games were being held in honour of. The couriers, however, had a very different method of depositing the funds, for they deemed it inappropriate to give it in sacrifice to Heracles. So it was decided that the funds were to be used for the construction of an unspecified amount of triremes. This small anecdote provides us a small glimpse into the mindset of some of the Jewish people. Jason had tried to be careful by sending as representatives those who had shown strong inclinations towards Hellenism, for they were officially now citizens of a Greek pole, but he had overestimated their willingness to follow even a simple thing as sacrificing to a Greek demigod. We will be closely monitoring the situation in Judea going forward as events there are intrinsically linked to Antiochus's time in power. I will also be using the name Jerusalem when mentioning that city going forward. Whilst he probably enjoyed the Quadrennial Games, the Seleucid monarch had other reasons for being in the area. Word had reached him that his young nephew Ptolemy had just undertook his official coronation to become sole pharaoh of Egypt, becoming Ptolemy VI Philomenor, the mother-loving. Speaking of his nickname, Ptolemy VI's mother was Cleopatra I, who just so happened to be Antiochus IV's sister, hence the current family connection between the two Hellenic monarchs. Antiochus dispatched Apollonius, the same man who had led the delegation to Rome to congratulate his young nephew. This was the reason on the surface anyway, whilst the real purpose of Apollonius's visit was more about finding out the new pharaoh's intentions. His father, Ptolemy V, had perished at the hands of his philoi in 180 BC when he was on the cusp of invading and retaking the old Ptolemaic possessions of Judea, Phoenicia, and Colia Syria from the Seleucids. With her son, by Ptolemy V, only being six years old at the time, Cleopatra had been the voice of reason, preventing another outbreak of war with her father, Antiochus III. For a few years, the situation in Egypt had been relatively peaceful and prosperous when compared to earlier years. But as we well know by now, these things tend not to last for long in the Hellenistic world. Queen Regent Cleopatra died in 176 BC due to an unknown cause, but it seems most likely a natural occurrence. On her deathbed, she declared two of her more capable advisors, Iulius and Linnaeus, as regents to the still young Ptolemy. As the boy's tutor, Iulius seemed a natural enough pick, whilst Linnaeus was originally a slave from Syria, who most likely accompanied their queen on her journey to be wedded. When Apollonius returned to the Seleucid king, he was concerned to hear that Ptolemy VI's government showed a great deal of hostility towards his outstretched arm. The advisers his mother had left him turned out to be warhawks who succeeded in convincing the teenage pharaoh to begin what his father had been planning, that being the total reconquest of the territories lost during the Fifth Syrian War. The sudden and bloody end to Seleucus IV's reign and the uncertain aftermath was in their eyes a moment of weakness to be exploited. With the pharaoh's state of mind now known to him, Antiochus began making his own preparations. With potential war looming over the horizon, he travelled to Jerusalem for the first time, where Jason gave him a magnificent welcome with lit torches and shouts. The purpose of this visit remains elusive, but it's a safe bet to say that he was making sure that Jerusalem would be secured enough from the Ptolemies should they reach the city. With these assurances seemingly given, the king marched back into the territory of Phoenicia.
One of Antiochus's chief concerns was to ensure that his own family affairs were in order before any fighting with the Ptolemies took place. In 172 BC, he married his stepdaughter Nisa to the Pontic king Phanikes I. In the same year, Queen Laodice IV gave birth to a healthy baby boy and girl, both named after their parents. This was ideal timing for the king, as these children would better secure the succession should anything happen to him during the forthcoming conflict. In 171 BC, Jason had sent a man named Menelaus to Antioch with the yearly tribute on behalf of the high priest. Menelaus, that being his adopted Greek name, was the brother of Simon, and it's safe to say he does not get a glowing write-up by the author of Book 2 of Maccabees when they describe him as, quote, having the hot temper of a cruel tyrant and the rage of a savage wild beast. Well, rather than simply handing over the tribute, Menelaus had grander designs for himself, for he made a simple proposal to the Vasileus and gathered all the air of authority he could muster. In return for pledging a higher annual tribute, exactly 3,000 silver talents more, Menelaus wanted the backing of Antiochus to become the new high priest. Delighted by the prospect of receiving much-needed funds to put to use against the Ptolemies, Antiochus took no issue with this and agreed that Menelaus would resume the office without delay. He easily forced Jason out from Jerusalem, who fled to the nearby lands on the other side of the Dead Sea. The supplanter thus being in turn supplanted would have been a fitting end for Jason, but he'll be making another appearance in due course. Shortly after Menelaus left his court, the king heard of unrest in the mountainous border satrapy of Kylikia. The cities of Tarsus and Malus had revolted, allegedly on the grounds that he had gifted these cities to his concubine Antiochus. But the only source which specifies this is Book 2 of Maccabees, so we should be cautious with this explanation. Kylikia was famous for its bandits, who preyed on innocent passers-by, which probably contributed to the overall unrest in the area. In his place, he left a man named Andronicus to oversee Antioch, and if Diodorus is to be believed, then the king gave the governor secret orders to have his young nephew finally put to death. There is no further mention of the ten-year-old boy beyond 171 BC. He had first been a puppet to state ministers, only to be sidelined and murdered soon afterwards. Quickly moving back to affairs in Jerusalem, Menelaus had not paid the increased tribute promised and had been summoned back to Antioch to answer for this. As we know, Antiochus had to leave to deal with local unrest, so Menelaus was left facing Andronicus at the capital. He had bought with him a number of gold vessels appropriated from the temple treasury in order to buy off Andronicus's judgment. He also sold treasures off to Tyre and many other places. It just so happened that during Menelaus's visit, the original high priest, Aeneas III, had been residing in the Jewish quarter of Antioch since being replaced as high priest. When Aeneas learned of Menelaus's despicable acts of theft, he began publicly exposing him. Becoming aware of these ravings against him, Menelaus turned to Andronicus to have the old man silenced. Fearing for his life, Aeneas fled to the nearby sanctuary to Apollo at Daphne with Andronicus and a squadron of the governor's guard in pursuit. Book 2 of Maccabees explains the violent end to the once high priest of Jerusalem. Quote, Andronicus came to Aeneas and resorting to treachery offered him sworn pledges and gave his right hand and in spite of his suspicion persuaded Aeneas to come out from the place of sanctuary. Then, with no regard for justice, he immediately put him out of the way. Aeneas had held a warm position in the hearts of both the Greek and Jewish residents in Antioch. A pouring of outcry and rage began to spill openly into the streets once the murder became public knowledge. <laughs> 
Having settled affairs in Kylikia, Antiochus returned and soon found out why the city was gripped in the state it was in. Sensing the public mood, the king began to grieve and openly weep for the fallen man on account of his prior services on behalf of the state. Inflamed by anger, Antiochus marched to where Andronicus was, stripped him of his purple robes and made a public spectacle out of him. Forcing him to walk all the way to the scene of his crime, he had the governor executed to the delight of the masses. Of course, all of this happened at the utmost convenience of Antiochus. The death of Andronicus led to the silencing of any rumours that the king had been involved in the sudden disappearance of his young nephew. Menelaus, meanwhile, got off easy and went back to Jerusalem. Not long after his return to Syria, in 170 BC, the Vassalaeus learned from various sources that the Ptolemies had begun attempting to enforce their claims over the Levant and Collier Syria in earnest. Representatives from many settlements informed the Seleucid government that the Ptolemies had started demanding tax revenues with promises of military action soon to follow. When the king tried writing to the Ptolemaic government, he was rebuffed with demands being released not long afterwards for even more tribute from the same cities as before. Writing as a contemporary to these events, Polybius states that Antiochus had dispatched Meliogor, Sosophanes and Heraclides with a message of condemnation on the behaviour of Ptolemy and his advisers to the Romans. Since the Battle of Panium in 200 BC, the Seleucids had controlled these areas by right of conquest and that the Ptolemies are the ones who are starting a new conflict which Antiochus used as his main lines of argument. A Ptolemaic delegation was also sent at the same time, counter-arguing that Antiochus III had taken advantage of Ptolemy V, for he was just a child at the time. Both sides were determined not to relinquish these claims, and so any upset in the East would surely provoke the res publica into action. The actual response from the Senate turned out to be uncharacteristically rather lacklustre, due to the Republic having to deal with the outbreak of the Third Macedonian War against King Perseus. In a statement, the Romans simply renewed their friendship with the Pharaoh of Egypt and promised the Seleucid delegates that they would send a statement to Ptolemy, asking him to rethink his current course of action. This real lack of response only showed to both sides that Rome was seemingly out of the picture, which would allow them to carry on as they saw fit. Viewing that now was the time to strike, the guardians of Ptolemy formally declared war on Antiochus IV later in the same year, officially inaugurating the Sixth Syrian War. For whatever reason, Aelius and Linnaeus were confident that the Seleucids were in a much weaker position than themselves. This was probably on the back of their defeat against Rome with all the financial burdens that this entailed and the still fairly recent instability at the Seleucid court. They boldly promised the people of Alexandria that a war now would be an easy and glorious affair. But as we know, Antiochus had been preparing for this exact moment. Whilst his delegation had been travelling to Rome, he had already assembled his forces at Tyre and was ready to bear the full might of his empire down on the insolent Ptolemies. By November of 170 BC, the Ptolemaic army had barely left the strategic city of Pelusion to begin their attack when all of a sudden they came face to face with the Seleucid army in the Senai Peninsula. No numbers are given in any of our sources for both sides, but Maccabees I mentions in passing that Antiochus commanded, quote, a strong force with chariots, elephants and cavalry. Surprised at how ready their opponents were for the attack, the Ptolemaic army was quickly routed with most of the casualties being sustained during their retreat to Pelusion, 
Such was normally the case in ancient warfare. But Diodorus tells us that the overall conduct of Antiochus during this mass flight of men was that of a true king. Quote, Though Antiochus was in a position to slaughter the defeated Egyptians, he rode about calling to his men not to kill them, but to take them alive. Before long, he reaped the fruits of his shrewdness, since this act of generosity contributed very greatly to a seizure of Pelusium, and later to the acquisition of all Egypt. Arriving at the gates of Pelusium, Antiochus was quick in its takeover, capturing the rest of the Ptolemaic army sent out against him, who now surrendered to his forces. Both Diodorus and Polybius, whilst mainly praising the king for his noble and regal character, mention that his takeover of Pelusion was completed through trickery and cunning. But sadly, no real details of this are given in both accounts. As the eastern gateway into the country, the Seleucid supply lines were now secured, whilst also threatening the rest of all Egypt. At the same time, the Seleucid navy, built in clear violation as per the terms of the Roman Seleucid Treaty, set sail from Tyre, where it was probably constructed. Its destination was the important island of Cyprus, which had been held by the Ptolemies since 294 BC. The island's current governor, Ptolemy Rakron, upon seeing the decisive loss of the Ptolemaic fleet, quickly betrayed the island over to Antiochus. Back on land, nothing could stop the Seleucid advance, as they reached the old pharaonic capital of Memphis, which also fell with ease. No further armies opposed him on the field, as the remaining forces of Ptolemy chose to hide behind their garrison forts. He crossed the Nile, stationing his own troops in Memphis, whilst the rest of the army followed the snaking mass of water back northwards. Whilst the Seleucids were marching about the place, cracks began to appear in the unity of the populace in Alexandria, as they were sent into a panic at the news of Pelusian's capture and the lightning speed at which Antiochus was moving through their country. Now seen as grossly incompetent to the task at hand, Elaeus and Linnaeus were swept aside by the Alexandrian mob, who voted to replace them with Commonus and Cineus. The new regents gathered envoys from across the Greek world in hopes that a compromise could be reached. Representatives from Achaea, Athens, Miletus and Ptolemy were soon sent down river to parley with the Seleucids. Antiochus greeted them all with splendour and was enthusiastic to hear what they had to say. After hearing them speak, all the delegates had pointed out the same faults, which led to them all being in the present situation. Namely, that Elaeus and Linnaeus were to blame as being the instigators of the conflict and for Ptolemy VI's inexperienced youthful nature getting the better of him. With these arguments made, they hoped these would be enough to appease the wrath of Antiochus. The king began by wholeheartedly agreeing with all their points, but started listing his reasons as to why the lands of Collier Syria were his by right. He recited that Ptolemy I had illegally held these lands, despite Seleucus I winning them by right of conquest from the Antigonids. Next, he reinforced this by stating how the region was won by right of conquest again by his father and were officially relinquished as part of the dowry for the marriage of Cleopatra I, the mother of the present pharaoh who they were representing. His auditory skills must have been something to behold, for he convinced everyone in attendance that his argument was the right one. When his audience left, he continued on to the town of Nocratis, which was less than 90 kilometers away from Alexandria. Showing that he had good intentions, Polybius has him gifting a gold stator to each of the Greek citizens there before pressing on to the Egyptian capital in 169 BC. For the first time ever, 
a Seleucid monarch was poised to take possession over all of Egypt. To many, it looked as if the lands of the Fertile Crescent and the Nile would be reunited once more. The last time this was done was under the rule of Alexander the Great himself. Even Seleucus I Nicator or Antiochus III Megas could not boast of such an achievement. Some sources even go as far as having Antiochus IV being proclaimed pharaoh upon his capture of Memphis, which historically was the place where prospective rulers went to be coronated as such. The only thing stopping a complete takeover was the shining metropolis of Alexandria itself. Famously a fickle people, and now in complete pandemonium, the Alexandrians forced the younger Ptolemy VIII, along with Cleopatra II, to create a rival government. Both were the siblings of Ptolemy VI, with the 16-year-old Cleopatra already married to the eldest of the two brothers. Euleus began stockpiling much wealth, and had at first convinced Ptolemy VI to abandon the kingdom altogether to travel to the island of Samothraki in the northern Aegean. But as it turned out, the older Ptolemy had a spine in him and decided that he would not flee. In a strange twist of fate, Ptolemy VI and Antiochus IV for the first time now shared a common cause in the opposition of Ptolemy VIII and the party that now surrounded him and Cleopatra. For Antiochus, the situation could not have been better, for he could now claim Egypt on behalf of his eldest nephew. In doing so, it made it much harder to give certain outside powers the excuse needed to intervene. Antiochus knew that the conflict between Rome and Perseus would not last forever, and the gaze of the Republic would undoubtedly shift back past mainland Greece. Because of this, he began seriously considering the possibility of ruling Egypt by proxy with his young nephew continuing to be a figurehead. Nearing the walls of Alexandria, news from Judea demanded his urgent attention, much to the relief of the Alexandrians. Annoyed would have been an understatement, but for now he was satisfied enough that the two brothers were at odds with one another. He commanded Ptolemy VI to continue the fight against his brother and sister without him for the time being. Before leaving, he helped to establish a rival court in Memphis for the elder brother. He then pulled all Seleucid forces stationed inside Egypt back towards Pelusion, leaving a strong garrison there. So what may you ask? could have caused the Vasileus to abandon the completion of his triumph? In order to answer that, we need to go back a few years to see how events had deteriorated in Judea, and it all begins with Menelaus again. After his return from Antioch in 171 BC, Menelaus rather unsurprisingly continued to help himself to the temple treasury, with his brother Lysimachus acting as his enforcer. It should also come as no surprise that the people of Jerusalem grew incredibly frustrated with the situation. Maccabees too describes what happened. Quote, when many acts of sacrilege had been committed in the city by Lysimachus with the connivance of Menelaus, and when report of them had spread abroad, the populace gathered against Lysimachus, because many of the gold vessels had already been stolen. And since the crowds were becoming aroused and filled with anger, Lysimachus armed about 3,000 men and launched an unjust attack under the leadership of a certain Uranus, a man advanced in years and no less advanced in folly. But when the Jews became aware of Lysimachus's attack, some picked up stones, some blocks of wood, and others took handfuls of the ashes that were lying about and threw them in wild confusion at Lysimachus and his men. As a result, they wounded many of them and killed some and put them all to flight, and the temple robber himself they killed close by the treasury. 
After this incident, Menelaus managed to round up the main instigators, putting to death those Jews who could prove the temple treasures were being appropriated as agents stirred up by the Ptolemies. He then travelled to Tyre, where he was to meet the king, but the Tyrians were so disgusted upon discovering his conduct. Their council brought charges against him. Once the king arrived, the Tyrians presented the charges, confident that the matter would be resolved quickly. At first, Antiochus agreed with the Tyrians, but they were clearly unaware about how crafty the high priest could be. With nothing left to lose, Menelaus bribed Ptolemy Macron with a small fortune to have a private word with the Vasileus, taking him to one side under a colonnade as if to have refreshments Ptolemy somehow convinced his new master to have all the charges dropped and even retained his high station. Around this time, Perseus requested urgent help from the Seleucids in his fight against Rome. The Third Macedonian War had shielded Antiochus's activities thus far from Rome's reach. If he were to help the Antigonid, then it would be seen as a clear provocation of war against the Republic which Antiochus was unwilling to entangle himself with. The Seleucid also had no real personal connection to the Macedonian monarch, with the prior marriage alliance being terminated at the death of Seleucus IV, and so was under no obligation to assist. During Antiochus's absence in the winter of 169 BC, events were moving apace in Egypt. After a very brief period of civil war, the three siblings were able to reconcile. Ptolemy VI clearly distrusted his uncle, for Pelusion was still in his possession and would allow for another easy invasion to destroy whichever of the siblings was left standing. Using this in his arguments, and with the help of Cleopatra II and the younger Ptolemy's friends, the two brothers agreed to a peace. Ptolemy VI was admitted back into Alexandria with the consent of the people, who were by now racked with hunger due to the disruption to the countryside caused by the Seleucid forces. Once there, the siblings dispatched another plea to Rome in hopes they would lend aid. The wicked uncle was enraged by the three Ptolemies uniting after informing the many envoys he had hosted he had marched into Egypt in the first instance to ensure Ptolemy VI's right as sole ruler. With his pretext now thwarted, he did exactly what the siblings feared he would do. By the beginning of 168 BC, a new and more brutal offensive was launched, quickly retaking the whole of Egypt except for Alexandria and its surrounding region for the second time. Many of the Egyptians submitted voluntarily, with many others being coerced under threats of violence. During the invasion of Egypt, the Romans had smashed Perseus and the Macedonian army at the Battle of Pydna by June of 168 BC. This stunning victory marked the end of the hostilities between the two as the Antigonid Macedonian kingdom was effectively no more marking the end of the first successor state to Alexander. As we will see, the battlefield victory of Pitna turned out to be the undoing of not just one king, but two. When the Seleucid force reached a suburb on the outskirts of the capital called Eleusis, they were met by a force of Romans. This force, however, consisted of no army, but rather a small party of senators led by Gaius Papilius Lanus. As the head of the delegation sent by Rome, Papilius was a natural choice for the assignment. He had been a consul in 172 BC and was a friend to the Vasileus back in his hostage days in Rome. What follows is one of the most famous occurrences in all of recorded antiquity, with many versions on how it all played out so I will be using parts of Livy's account mixed in to create my own retelling. Walking towards the Roman delegation, Antiochus recognised his old friend Papilius and extended a hand in warm greetings. To his surprise, 
Papilius instead thrust into the king's outstretched hand a tablet with a decree from the Senate, and told him first of all to read it. The decree was an ultimatum. Antiochus was to abandon his unsanctioned war against Egypt and evacuate back to his own territory, leaving behind all the lands he had seized. Attempting to play for time, he told the commissioners that he needed to go away so he could assemble a council of his philoi to advise him on the matter. Before he had time to take a step, Pompilius took his cane and began drawing a circle in the sand around the astonished Antiochus. Upon completion, Papilius said, Before you step out of that circle, give me a reply to lay before the Senate. The king of the Seleucids hesitated for a long while. Papilius was strongly implying that to walk away without giving an answer would mean a declaration of war. With the conflict with Macedon now over, Rome could have the focus and resources to back up these threats. With those thoughts weighing heavily on his mind, he finally responded, I will do what the Senate thinks right. It was as if a switch had been flicked inside Papilius, as his serious demeanour quickly became soft and jovial. He finally grabbed his old friend by the hand as a friend and ally of Rome. Known as the day of Eleusis in our source material, the meeting marked the end of the sixth and final Syrian war. The Seleucids and Ptolemies will continue to still clash on the odd occasion, but the question of who owned Collier Syria had been permanently settled in favour of the Seleucids. It only took over a century and six wars to answer the question, but we got there in the end. Whilst he successfully upheld his claim, Antiochus obviously lost all the gains made during the conflict, evacuating all his troops from mainland Egypt and Cyprus by the appointed date. Sources say that he and the army still kept much of the vast riches they accumulated. The turncoat, Ptolemy Macron, being unable to resume his post as governor of the island due to his treachery, was given the position of strategoi over Collier Syria and Phoenicia by Antiochus. Many of the surrounding powers congratulated the Roman commissioners for keeping the peace, for surely without them, the Ptolemies would have undoubtedly met their end. Polybius recognised the day of Eleusis as a true turning point. To him, this was the precise moment that confirmed Rome's dominance over the eastern part of the Mediterranean, despite still not directly controlling any land there at this point in the narrative. From here on out, the Ptolemies would take few actions without the direct approval of the Roman Senate, for they now looked to Rome more than they did their own ancestors. Even the once mighty powerful Antigonid kingdom, which had been established by Demetrius I Polyarchites, had been virtually wiped off the map. The days where the Hellenistic powers unquestionably reigned supreme now seem to be well and truly over. The king's temper at this time was understandably soured by his humiliating 180 out of Egypt. For him, the perfect outlook presented itself when further news arrived from Jerusalem. During his second Egyptian campaign, a false rumour had been circulating that the Seleucid Vasileus had been struck down dead. Since his fall from grace, his original pick of high priest, Jason, had been biding his time, waiting on the other side of the Dead Sea for the moment to make a comeback. Maccabees too gives a good account on his activities. Quote, Jason took no less than a thousand men and suddenly made an assault upon the city. When the troops upon the wall had been forced back and at last the city was being taken, Menelaus took refuge in the citadel. But Jason kept relentlessly slaughtering his fellow citizens, not realising that success at the cost of one's kindred is the greatest misfortune, but imagining that he was setting up trophies of victory 
over enemies and not over fellow countrymen. Jason's killing spree was cut short when, to his absolute horror, news had been broken to him that a disgruntled Antiochus was very much alive and was currently making a beeline with his army for the holy city. Unsurprisingly, he did not stay long enough to see the king's wrath and fled into exile again, where after wandering between many places, he ended up dying amongst the Lacedaemonians in the Peloponnese, unmourned and without funeral. Reaching the walls of Jerusalem, under the assumption the city had rebelled against him, Antiochus's troops stormed in, killing everyone and anything that they came across in an orgy of violence. With Menelaus's assistance, the Seleucids continually brutalized the city and its inhabitants for three whole days. At its end, Maccabees II claims the shocking number of 80,000 destroyed lives, with 40,000 of these dying in hand-to-hand -hand combat, whilst the same number had been rounded up as slaves for the markets. I am unsure if these numbers can be relied upon, but we can be certain that the casualty rate was indeed substantial regardless. Climbing the steps up to the Holy Temple, Antiochus appropriated whatever wealth was left in the temple treasury. Josephus describes how he, quote, stripped the temple, carrying off all the vessels of God, the golden lampstands, and the golden altar and table, and the other altars, and not even forbearing to take the curtains, which were made of the finest linen and scarlet. He also emptied the temple of its hidden treasures and left nothing at all behind, thereby throwing the Jews into deep mourning. With the temple thoroughly looted in this way, the king began issuing decrees completely forbidding Jewish religious practices, such as observing the Sabbath and circumcision. Those who were found to have held the Torah in their possession would be punished under capital offence. Copies found were to be burned immediately. Adding to this, the king oversaw the setup of what Daniel calls the abomination of desolation inside the temple. Gone was the sacrificing of a lamb twice a day to the Jewish god, and in its place, was a statue of Zeus and a daily sacrifice of pig on the holy altar. It becomes clear that this was an abomination to the Jews as swine was considered an unclean and non-pure animal to sacrifice. One story from Maccabees 2 tells that of a woman and her seven sons. All were tortured and executed by Antiochus's men for refusing to eat pork and renounce their faith. The mother encouraged her sons to remain steadfast, and they chose death over disobedience to their religious laws. To top all this off, Antiochus ordered a new tax to be drafted, and the construction of a massive stronghold called the Acura, which derives its name from the Greek Acropolis. This looming structure would be home to a permanent Seleucid garrison, who were ideally situated to monitor the city below for trouble and to ensure the Greek way of offering sacrifice was being observed in the temple. Leaving the high priest Menelaus to enforce these oppressive policies and a man named Philip as the garrison commander, the Vasileus finally returned to Antioch with all the wealth from Jerusalem. So elated was he, according to Maccabees II, that he thought he could, quote, sail on the land and walk on the sea. It was probably at around this time, if not slightly earlier, that the king began the undertaking of what would be the fourth and final expansion of the Syrian capital of Antioch. This new quarter, named Epiphania after himself, was built on and around the nearby mountains which included an aqueduct, council hall, marketplace, and a massive temple to Zeus Olympus, which housed a set of golden statues of the god himself and that of Nike, 
symbolizing that Zeus was the bringer of victory. The ceiling was overlaid with a radiant gold, and all the walls were covered in gold leaves. The god of gods even began making a more prominent appearance throughout the empire on the higher value coinage which was normally reserved for the dynasty's chosen deity, Apollo. Elsewhere, Antiochus IV had sent Greek settlers to take up residence in the old city of Babylon back at around 173 BC. Thanks to a surviving Babylonian tablet titled the Greek Community Chronicle, we can credit Antiochus IV with establishing the first substantial Greek presence in the city since the days of Seleucus I Nicator, who had of course used the city as his original capital back when he was establishing the fledgling Seleucid Empire. Since the foundation of Seleucia on the Tigris, a significant number of Babylon's population had been relocated to the new intended capital. Whilst not falling completely off the map, its significance to the Seleucid rulers had been reduced. They would occasionally travel there and would stay in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar the Great in order to perform the city's religious rites as Seleucus I and Antiochus I had done before them. Antiochus III was even said to have appropriated a set of ornate robes once worn by Nebuchadnezzar from the New Year's festival house. As a true Hellenistic monarch, Antiochus Epiphanes built or reimagined about 15 different settlements across his empire. Some examples include the founding of older settlements such as Carax, located in the mouth of the Persian Gulf. The site had originally been refounded as Pella, named after Alexander's birthplace, but it had been hit by severe flooding sometime shortly afterwards. Antiochus rebuilt the city as Antiochia in Susania by 166 BC. He sent Hyspausenes to be satrap of the region, with this settlement as his regional capital. Other settlements, most notably the important capital city of Media, was frequently known as another Epiphania, like the new quarter at Antioch on the Orontes. Livy said that there were two matters in which Antiochus IV showed the virtues of a true king, that of adorning cities and his piety towards the gods. We've already discussed his earlier building projects, of the temples to Zeus in both Athens and at Antioch. Besides these, he most notably dedicated a series of altars and statues on the island of Delios. He promised the Peloponnesian city of Megalopolis fortification walls and gave over the majority of the finances for it. Also in the Peloponnese, he began construction of a grand marble theatre in Tegea. Also noted was his generosity to the people of Rhodes, giving them all manner of things which they desperately required. 166 BC oversaw a famous occurrence within Antiochus IV's reign, known as the Daphne Parade. We are told that the Vassalius wanted to outdo a series of spectacles held in Macedon by the victor of Pydna, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, now with the nickname Macedonicus, following his conquest. To achieve this, Antiochus dispatched messengers on a sacred mission across the Greek-speaking world, announcing to all of the games that were to take place at the sanctuary of Daphne just outside Antioch. The same place where Aeneas III had been murdered only five years earlier would now host an altogether different spectacle for all to witness. I'll let Polybius do the talking for a bit. Quote, the festival opened with a procession composed as follows. It was headed by 5,000 men in the prime of their life armed after the Roman fashion 
and wearing breastplates of chain armour. Next came 5,000 Mycenaeans, and immediately behind them, 3,000 Kylikians, armed in the manner of light infantry, wearing gold crowns. Next came 3,000 Thracians and 5,000 Gauls. They were followed by 20,000 Macedonians, of whom 10,000 bore golden shields, 5,000 brazen shields, and the rest silver shields. Next marched 250 pairs of gladiators, and behind them a thousand horsemen from Nyssa, and three thousand from Antioch itself, most of whom had crowns and trappings of gold, and the rest trappings of silver. Next to these came the so-called Companion Cavalry, numbered about a thousand, all with golden trappings, and next to the Regiment of Royal Friends, of equal number and similarly accorded, next a thousand picked horse followed by the so-called Agema, supposed to be the Crack Cavalry Corps, numbering about a thousand. Last of all marched the Cataphract, or Mailed Horse, the horses and men being armed in complete mail, as the name indicated. Next came a hundred chariots drawn by six horses, and forty drawn by four horses, and then a chariot drawn by four elephants, and finally, thirty-six elephants in single file with their housings. About eight hundred young men wearing gold crowns made part of it as well as about a thousand fat cattle, and nearly three hundred cows presented by the various sacred missions, and eight hundred ivory tusks. The vast quantity of images it is impossible to enumerate. For representations of all the gods and spirits mentioned, or worshipped by men, and of all the heroes were carried along, some gilded and others draped in garments embroidered with gold, and they were all accompanied by representations executed in precious materials of the myths relating to them, as traditionally narrated. Behind them came images of night and day, of earth and heaven, and dawn and midday. The quantity of gold and silver plate may be estimated from what follows. The slaves of one of the royal friends, Dionysus, the private secretary, marched along carrying articles of silver plate, none of them weighing less than a thousand drachmae, and six hundred of the king's own slaves went by bearing articles of gold plate. Next, there were about two hundred women sprinkling the crowd with perfumes from golden urns, and these were followed by eighty women seated in litters with golden feet, and five hundred in litters with silver feet, all richly dressed. Such were the more remarkable features of the procession. Much can be gleaned from Polybius's texts, with many modern scholars using these few paragraphs to create entire papers on the subject. We obviously do not have the time to go in so much depth, but it's worth noting some key aspects. First of all, it is worth noting that the procession and some of the games were clearly inspired by Antiochus's time as a hostage in Rome. The 5,000 young men armed in the Roman fashion is the clearest example, but the mention of gladiators and gladiatorial games were also Roman in origin. Such spectacle would have been a novelty with this being the first recorded instance of gladiatorial games within the Seleucid Empire. The king began by exporting gladiators from Rome at a great cost, but soon found that he could inspire many young men within his realm to train in the deadly art. The explicit mention of Thracian and Galatian contingents during the military procession is to me the second standout feature. As you may recall, one of the conditions leading to the Roman Seleucid signing of the Treaty of Apamea was the non-recruitment of peoples from across the Taurus Mountains. It could be that these were mercenaries 
choosing to fight for the Seleucids as private contingents. Or perhaps groups of these people were settled within the empire. Then again, we know that Antiochus was willing and able to break other conditions of the treaty. The reformation of the Seleucid navy beyond the established ten vessels that was allowed for self-protection only is a clear example of this, so it would not be too hard to imagine the Seleucids actively recruiting these peoples to be a standard part of their army once more. On another note, the Vasileus's own behaviour during these proceedings is of great interest to me. To quote Polybius again, quote, All the arrangements were made by the king in person. He rode on a sorry pony along the procession, ordering it to advance or halt as the case might be. At banquets, again, he stood himself in the entrance and led in some of the guests and ushered others to their seats, himself leading in also the attendants who carried the dishes. Then he would walk around the room, occasionally sitting down and occasionally reclining. And then, putting down as the case might be the cup or morsel he was holding, he would jump up and change his place, going all around the banquet, accepting toasts standing from this man or that, and making fun of the musical performance. Finally, when the chorus had been going on for long, and many of the guests had already left, the king, entirely wrapped up, was carried in by the mimes and deposited on the ground, as if he were one of them himself. The band was now summoned, and he jumped up, would dance and act with the burlesque players, so that all the guests were abashed and left the feast. Many other stories have survived pertaining to Antiochus IV's rather bizarre character. One relates how when he was not on campaign, he would exchange his royal regalia for that of a white toga, and would beg individuals for their vote either to the position of edile or tribune. Once elected, he would sit in an ivory corral chair and preside over lawsuits. Knowing these to be Roman customs, some of the people thought it unbefitting a king of an empire. Many of the people living even in his own time made the use of the king's own nickname as he was often referred to not as Epiphanes, but the similarly sounding Epimanes, which meant madman. The king had a strong like for drink, with Polybius going so far as saying that he mixed a water fountain in Antioch with wine. If true, then this would have made for a not so subtle substitute for a hip flask. Quote, he not only used to go to entertainments of the common citizens, but he would also drink with any strangers who happened to be subjourning in the city, and even with those of the meanest class. And if he heard that any of the younger men were making a feast anywhere whatever, he would come with an earthen bowl and with music, and so the greater part of the feasters fled away, alarmed at his unexpected appearance. To some people, he used to give gazelles knuckle bones, to others dates, and to others money. Occasionally, he used to address people he had never seen before when he met them, and make them the most unexpected kinds of presents. He also used to bathe in the public baths, when they were full of common people, having jars of the most precious ointments brought in for him, and on one occasion, when someone said to him, How lucky you are, you kings, to use such scents and smell so sweet, he answered nothing at the time, but the next day, when the man was having his bath, he came in after him and had a huge jar of the most precious ointment called Stante poured over his head, so that all the bathers jumped up and rolled themselves in it, and by slipping in it created great amusement, as did the king himself. <laughs>
At around the same time as the proceedings at Daphne, events in Judea were taking another violent turn on a whole nother level. Following the harsh repression of the Jewish faith, a series of building projects took place around the Judean countryside to set up more altars to the Greek pantheon. In the town of Modin, some 20 miles south of Jerusalem, a group of Macedonian officials arrived to ensure that the sacrifices were being carried out as per the king's command. The spiritual head of this town was a Kohen, or Jewish priest, named Matthias, who, with his five sons, formed the Hasmonean family. As the spiritual leader of the town, the officials commanded Matthias to set the example to the others by offering up sacrifices first. To do so would make them friends of the king and they would be rewarded for their cooperation. However, Matthias refused, insisting that both he and his sons would continue following the ways of their forefathers. When another man stepped forward to take Matthias's place, the Kohen killed him on the altar, and both him and his sons killed the officials there afterwards. Raising the altar until there was nothing left, Matthias and his sons left their worldly possessions behind and fled to the nearby mountains. Word quickly spread of what had transpired at Modin, and soon many disenfranchised Jews began flocking to Matthias and his sons. From here, they would launch raids into other nearby towns, particularly those which had a high proportion of Hellenized Jews. These raids typically involved forcible circumcision of males, as well as the destruction of the Greek sacrificial altars. The raids continued in this way for about a year under the leadership of Matthias, but by the spring of 166 BC he died, probably of natural causes. On his deathbed, he appointed the most warlike of his sons to continue leading the fight. This was his third son, named Judah. After burying Matthias at their ancestral tomb in Modin, Judah, along with his brothers, led their followers in a series of guerrilla attacks against their oppressors. The Seleucid forces were too strong in a straight-up fight, but Judah knew that with his small band, he could easily pick his targets, melting back into the mountains afterwards. Fighting in this way, he and his band would soon become too much of a nuisance to ignore. The Seleucids, probably on the orders of Menelaus and Philip in Jerusalem, sent Apollonius, the same man who had been sent by Antiochus to treat with Ptolemy VI years earlier, to deal with these misfits. Now the strategoi of the neighbouring Sumaria, Apollonius held a particularly cruel place in the hearts of many Jews for his deceitful actions during the plunder of Jerusalem. The account of the engagement between Apollonius and Judah is recorded in Maccabees 1, named the Battle of the Ascent of Lebona. Hardly anything is known regarding the battle itself, other than its outcome, which was a massacre for the Seleucids. Even though they had the larger force, consisting mostly of local levies, Judah and his men had single-minded zeal on their side. Our source mentions that Judah found the knights to be most advantageous in such attacks. Apollonius was slain during the melee, apparently being struck down in personal combat against Judah. Apollonius was slain during the melee after apparently being struck down in personal combat against Judah himself. Lifting the sword from the dead Strategoi's cold grasp, Judah would use this as his weapon of choice for the rest of his life. It may have been because of this initial clash that Judah earned himself the nickname Maccabeus, which translates to the Hammer. It was probably much later that the people under Judah's command were given the general term of the Maccabees. Soon after his initial victory, another army was dispatched under the commander named Seron, who was supposedly the governor of Syria. 
Maccabees I describes the Seleucid army again as being made up of another large host with no numbers given. The army was traversing through a narrow pass known as Beth Horon in order to get to the rebels' last known position. Unbeknownst to them, Judah laid in waiting for this column of men at that very pass. The ambush was a complete success, with the source claiming that 800 Seleucids were killed, with only a few survivors making it out alive. Like with all history, we must be careful when analysing these two battles. The events themselves are probably accurate, but the Book of Maccabees are our only source of the two battles, and as we know, they have a heavy bias against the Seleucids. Throughout the text, Judah and his followers are regularly compared with legendary past heroes of the Jewish tradition. The numbers of both Seleucid forces sent against Judah remain suspiciously unspecified, but are claimed to be massive. Such claims should be seen as an exaggeration, in order to make the Maccabees seem almost unstoppable in their righteous quest against their oppressors. Even the ranks held by Apollonius and Seron seem to be an exaggeration in order to make their defeats all the more embarrassing. We have no idea if Apollonius actually died at the hands of Judah, but either way, it's a nice touch that was certainly used during the time to inspire more people to the Jewish cause. Whilst the hammer was racking up his kill count, Antiochus IV was preparing to journey to the eastern parts of his realm by the summer of 165 BC. Some sources claimed that the king was suffering some financial difficulties, most likely due to his lavish spending, and that this expedition was to recover long overdue tribute from the eastern satrapies, which may have been in rebellion during this time. The Seleucid monarch also had designs on reintegrating the territory of Armenia, which had broken away shortly after the battlefield defeat at Magnesia in 189 BC. Further east, the Arsacid Parthians presented an ever-looming threat as their incursions began causing major disruptions to the trade along the land routes to India. Before setting off, he installed the general Lysias to oversee affairs in the west. Whilst he was away, the governor was also appointed the protector of Antiochus's then seven-year-old son and would act as the boy's regent should anything happen to the Vasileus. Leaving half the royal army in Syria with Lysias to deal with the troubles in Judea, Antiochus took the remaining half with him across the Euphrates River he would never see his family or capital city again. Marching through the rugged mountains of Armenia, the Seleucids confronted the Armenian army under their king Artaxes I near their capital of Artaxarta. Antiochus was able to defeat them handily, capturing Artaxes in the process. In order to buy off his ransom, the Armenian monarch agreed to submit to Antiochus as his overlord, reincorporating the territory back into the empire. The army then pressed on towards Seleucia on the Tigris and Babylon, where the king no doubt received a royal welcome. After leaving these behind, he marched down to the Persian Gulf, where Livy mentions he commissioned a further exploration of the area. This bust on screen, by the way, is the only known surviving example of Antiochus IV to make it to the present day, currently located at the Altes Museum in Berlin. Back in Antioch, Lysias was determined to see the rebels led by the Hasmoneans crushed. In Jerusalem, Menelaus and the garrison commander Philip were requesting aid to the Strategoi of both Phoenicia and Collier Syria, Ptolemy Macron, due to how widespread the disruption had become within the region. Lysias sent a portion of the army in Syria under the generals Nicanor and Gorgias to link up with the local forces under Ptolemy Macron. The goal was simple, smash the Hasmonean rebels hiding in the Elon Valley 
and then link up with Menelaus and Philip. With a combined force of 20,000, the three generals marched southward together on the road towards Jerusalem by September of 165 BC. Maccabees II describes how, along the march, Nicanor ran a side hustle by using a part of the army to capture non-Hellenized Jews so they could be taken to the coast to be sold as slaves. Reaching the town of Emmaus, the Seleucid force established their camp there. Situated on the edge of the Elon Valley, the nearby hills provided plentiful fresh water and Emmaus's location allowed for several potential routes into the valley. Breaking camp, the army began ascending into the valley to find and destroy the enemy. Judah and his 6,000 followers were at their camp at Mizpah when they heard of the Seleucid advance. After performing a moral raising ceremony, he ordered about half his men to decamp for what he was planning required speed which could only be achieved by smaller numbers. Placing his brothers Simon, Jonathan and Joseph in charge of sections of the small force, the Maccabees made their way towards Emmaus but not to confront the Seleucids head on. Seeing the rebel camp abandoned at Misphah, Nicanor and Gorgias assumed their prey had fled in terror and began searching the surrounding area. Little did they suspect that the Maccabees had slipped right under their noses earlier in the day. Using various other pathways, they managed to bypass the Gentiles. With the sun disappearing on the horizon, the Maccabees launched their dawn attack on the now under-defended Seleucid encampment. The completely stunned soldiers left behind stood little chance in their unprepared state as the sound of many horns blared out in the night air around them. Getting wind of the commotion to their rear, the main bulk of the Seleucid force marched back to their camp only to find it completely ablaze and looted. Unable to determine how many of the enemy there were, the generals decided to make a hasty retreat towards the coastline. The Maccabees did not pursue the Seleucids the next day as the Sabbath had to be observed. Bolstered by their stunning victory, the rebels now held in their possession the funds raised by Nicanor's slaving enterprise, as well as better quality arms and armour. Nicanor himself is said to have discarded his splendid armour to ironically don the rags of a runaway slave, returning back to Antioch only achieving the destruction of the army. Upon hearing of this calamity, Lysias began attempts to negotiate with the rebels, but these soon fell through, probably due to Antiochus's denial of the demands made by the Maccabees. Lysias soon marched out of Syria at the head of a much larger force, apparently numbering 80,000 troops, but this seems unlikely. Again, not much is clear on what really happened, but it appears that the force under Judah launched themselves at part of the Seleucid army, inflicting a significant amount of casualties. The historian behind the Book of Maccabees clearly sees this as another victory for the hammer, but modern historians see it more as a stalemate. Whatever the case, during the halt in hostilities, news from the east rapidly reached both sides. Antiochus IV Epiphanes, Vasileus of the Seleucid Empire, was dead. Now the regent of the entire realm, Lysias quickly calculated that he needed to return to Antioch immediately in order to secure his grip on power with the young Antiochus at his side. Concluding a hasty treaty, the regent was forced to give the ground to the rebels as he set off northwards back towards Syria. Emboldened by the news of Antiochus's sudden death and the departure of Lysias, the Maccabees soon took over Jerusalem apart from the Acara, where pro-Hellenistic Jews and the Seleucid garrison still held out for the time being. They tore down the statue of Zeus along with the Greek altar and reinstated the traditional practices 
of the religion of their forefathers. Judah, the defender of the faith, had won an important victory in retaking the holy city, but the war was far from over. The demise of Antiochus IV is surrounded by many stories and legends. Most of our sources are in agreement that he tried to appropriate the treasury at a temple dedicated to the goddess Artemis in Susa. They go on to say how his army was defeated and that he had to beat a hasty retreat. Our sources then deviate rather spectacularly as to the sudden death of the Seleucid monarch. Some, such as Appian, state that he simply died of a disease contracted during his retreat that forced his body to waste away. Eusebius states that the king died fighting during his attempted robbery, whilst Polybius has him die of madness. Maccabees I says the king was greatly shaken after hearing the news pertaining to the defeats inflicted by the Hasmoneans. Taking to his bed due to growing ill with grief, he summoned his advisers and uttered, quote, Sleep departs from my eyes, and I am downhearted with worry. To what distress I have come, and into what a great flood I now am plunged. For I was kind and beloved in my power, but now I remember the evils I did in Jerusalem. I seized all her vessels of silver and gold, and I sent to destroy the inhabitants of Judea without good reason. I know that it is because of this that these evils have come upon me, and behold, I am perishing of deep grief in a strange land. If you thought that was poetic license, then wait until you hear the account from Maccabees too. In this alternative version, whilst riding a chariot, he is said to have wanted to make Jerusalem a graveyard for Jews when hearing of the defeats. Quote, as soon as he ceased speaking, he was seized with a pain in his bowels, for which there was no relief and with sharp internal tortures, and that very justly, for he had tortured the bowels of others with many and strange inflictions. Yet he did not in any way stop his insolence, but was even more filled with arrogance, breathing fire in his rage against the Jews, and giving orders to hasten the journey. And so it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along, and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body. Thus he who had just been thinking that he could command the waves of the sea in his superhuman arrogance and imagining that he could weigh the high mountains in a balance was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of God manifest to all. And so the ungodly man's body swarmed with worms, and whilst he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh rotted away, and because of his stench the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. Because of his intolerable stench, no one was able to carry the man who a little while before had thought he could touch the stars of heaven. Then it was that, broken in spirit, he began to lose much of his arrogance and to come to his senses under the scourge of God, for he was tortured with pain at every moment. We may never know exactly what happened to him, but the fact was that he was now dead remains the same. Leaving the empire to another boy, who was not yet ready and old enough for the trials that lay ahead. Whether he charmed or horrified you during our narrative, there is no denying that Antiochus IV Epiphanes certainly lived an interesting life as a standout ruler. If there was to be one key takeaway from all that has been discussed, then it should be that this Antiochus was certainly a complicated character. To his people, he was charismatic and, dare I say, eccentric. Besides the line in the sand incident with Papilius, 
he could utilize his charm to closely stage manage other people's perceptions of him, truly seeing the world as his stage. He was a pious man who gifted lavishly to the gods and a great builder and benefactor to his empire and the wider Greek-speaking world. Despite the brevity of his conquests, he oversaw great battlefield victories for his realm, with the near-complete conquest twice of Egypt and Cyprus, with the submission of Armenia to boot. By contrast, to many others, he was a complete psychopath who tried to eradicate the Jewish religion, often associated with the Antichrist in later years. He was a drunkard, whose spending of state funds was completely out of line with reality. A usurper who had no right to rule but yet did so anyway, killing his young nephew in the process. A madman who wasted time playing at being a Roman tribune when it was well established that Hellenistic kings were far above such things. Finding the truth in history can be hard at the best of times. This gets even trickier when dealing with ancient history, and Antiochus IV is a prime example of this. Did he have strong views of Hellenizing the Jews from the get-go? If you ask the traditionalists back then, and even some people in our own time, then they would say definitely yes. Based on my analysis pertaining his actual actions, I would say probably not although it is obvious that later in his reign, he did launch a major push to Hellenize local peoples to better integrate them within the Seleucid framework. Antiochus IV's policy towards the Jewish people is definitely unusual for its time when you consider the amount of religious tolerance shown by those that had come before him. It can be universally agreed by all that the rise of the Maccabees should be seen as a major failure of Antiochus IV's reign, having undone all the good work laid by Antiochus III in that region. Regarding the sack of Jerusalem, the violence might have been limited to those who were pro-Jason within the city, but a general massacre would have been extremely difficult even for the greatest of commanders to stop. It is my belief that he was misinformed, thinking the initial unrest in Jerusalem to be a general uprising against Seleucid rule, rather than infighting between the pro- and anti-Hellenistic factions. His later heavy-handed policies at Hellenizing seems to have been part of a wider issue that Antiochus thought needed addressing. By this time, the Eastern Mediterranean and the wider Middle East had been a battleground between the three major powers of the Seleucids, Antigonids, and Ptolemies for around 150 years. With Rome marching in from the west and the Parthians encroaching from the east, it seems likely that Antiochus was trying to build a wider shared identity throughout his realm through Hellenism. The intense construction and renaming of cities in the Greco-Macedonian fashion also comes to mind here. There is a tendency for many historians to point to the defeat at Magnesia as the turning point that marked the inevitable decline of the Seleucid Empire. Whilst this makes for a neat narrative, the evidence within our sources shows that it's not as straightforward as that. People had seen the empire's fortunes and territory contract and rebound before, so why could it not do so again? Events such as the parade at Daphne and the invasions of Egypt are clear indications that the Seleucid army at this time was not too dissimilar to the armies led by Seleucus I or Antiochus III, a force that was still very capable and highly organized. In my mind, one of his biggest legacies was providing the blueprints for future Seleucid princes and pretenders by showing them indirectly the methods on how power could now be obtained. In his work, The Land of the Elephant Kings, Space, Territory and Ideology in the Seleucid Empire, Cosmin points out 
that from the ascension of Antiochus IV, many of the Seleucid rulers, right up until the ultimate demise of the empire, were crowned as king just before or right after entering Seleucid territory. Up until this point, all Seleucid rulers had stayed within the defined boundaries of their lands, with the notable exception to this being when they went on campaigns of conquest. This more often than not allowed the facilitation of well-planned, predetermined transitions of power, but the Treaty of Apamea acted as a catalyst for a change in these dynamics, as members of the royal household were now residing outside of the empire's territory. With Antiochus IV being crowned as Vasileus in this way, he had shown that power could be acceptably bestowed externally, sometimes by the backing of foreign powers, rather than internally by the present ruler. This ultimately created a dent in central authority, which we will see disintegrate more and more over time, as the civil wars between rival claimants forced more members of the royal family to seek refuge abroad for their own safety. In turn, this would mean perpetuating the vicious cycle when they eventually tried to make a comeback seeking the ultimate prize. Thank you for tuning in to episode 8 of the Seleucid Empire. As always, your support means a lot to me as we slowly continue this narrative. Next time on the series, the war between the Maccabees and Seleucids will continue under Lysias and Antiochus V Eupator. We will also cover the rise of Seleucus IV's eldest son, Demetrius I Soter. If you have enjoyed what has been covered in this video, why not leave a like and a comment or subscribe if you want to see more. The sources used for this episode have been included in the video's description. So until you hear the drums of war again, this has been Obscure History.